Hi everyone, my name is Karthik Mahadevan. Um, I'm a master's student from the University of Calgary. And today I'll be presenting our group's work, which is communicating awareness and intent in autonomous vehicle pedestrian interaction. So, um, I want to start off by looking at the current situation that we uh, encounter as pedestrians when we're making crossing decisions today. So we as pedestrians um, use two different types of cues when we're making our crossing decisions, and research has shown that both of these are very crucial. The first type of cues are called vehicle cues, and these are uh, specifically coming from the vehicle itself. So things like the vehicle speed, um, where does it stop with respect to where the pedestrian is standing, um, how fast is it slowing down, how slow is it slowing down. The other type of cues that um, pedestrians receive when they're making their crossing decisions is um, some of the more informal communication that comes from the driver. So things like um, eye gaze, hand gestures, and possibly even voice depending on the driving culture. So um, together, both of these types of cues, awareness and intent, um, uh, or both of these types are the driver cues and the vehicle cues, they communicate awareness and intent to pedestrians. So what is awareness? Awareness is acknowledging um, the pedestrian's presence. Um, and intent is communicating what the vehicle is about to do, whether it's about to stop or to continue. So um, in the near future, um, we're going to see um, varying levels of autonomy on our street. Um, and we're likely going to encounter uh, vehicles that are um, manually driven, um, which will have drivers on board who will communicate with people outside the vehicle. We're going to have semi-autonomous vehicles, which will have some level of autonomy, so the driver may or may not be engaged. And so they may or may not communicate with the pedestrian. And in fully autonomous vehicles, we won't even have a driver on board. We may have somebody inside the vehicle, but they're going to be passengers at that point. And so they won't communicate driver cues. So um, because this transition is going to take a long time, uh, pedestrians are going to be interacting with all these different types of vehicles. And, we're, and they're likely going to be having uh, issues if the driver is not going to be able to communicate anything in autonomous vehicles. So we focus specifically on the, the fully autonomous case. And we looked at how autonomous vehicles can communicate the same two things, awareness and intent to a pedestrian, um, when there are no driver cues. So we propose the use of interfaces um, that explicitly communicate the vehicle's awareness and intent to pedestrians. Um, we're not the first to propose these ideas. We've seen concepts from industry. Um, for example, here we have a Mercedes that is projecting on the street to help the pedestrian make a crossing decision. Similarly here, we have a display inside the vehicle um, showing text. There's also been some research in this area um, that have looked at specific instances of, for example, using LEDs or uh, LED strips, for example, both in this one and this one. And um, what we notice is that a lot of the design space is still unexplored. And we also noticed that awareness has, for the most part, not been explored so much. So intent, the vehicle's next action, so whether it's going to stop or not stop, have been explored. But awareness, which is assuring the pedestrian that, hey, I'm going to stop, or, or hey, I've seen you, was not something we saw. And so we wanted to explore the design space of what is possible in terms of interfaces that we could make. So um, to do this, uh, to explore the design space, um, we created a participatory design study um, where we invited a bunch of designers, 10 of them, and um, they essentially were asked or tasked to uh, create interfaces that help an autonomous vehicle, a fully autonomous vehicle, communicate two things, awareness and intent. And for this task, um, we allowed them or we gave them a shared design surface, which is a very traditional or typical pedestrian crosswalk scenario where there's a vehicle, a pedestrian and a traffic light and crossings. To help them brainstorm, to help our participants brainstorm, we gave them a couple of different labels. Um, so there were eight labels in total, but for example, we had an LED strip or display. This was so pedestrian, our, our, our participants wouldn't be stuck and wouldn't, would be able to start um, with some examples in mind so that they could create their interfaces. So um, using the data that we received from our participants, we got 34 designs um, from 10 participants. Um, we also recorded all the study sessions. We transcribed them and open coded them. We found a few different interesting things. The first is that all 34 of the designs we received incorporated intent communication, which is what is the vehicle going to do next? So for example, here we have a speaker and it has uh, different sound effects to communicate or voice actually to communicate about to stop or about to start. There's also an LED that communicates the same thing visually. Um, we noticed that for the most, most of the designs, 22 of them out of the 34, they also incorporated awareness, which is what is a vehicle uh, or has the vehicle seen the pedestrian and how does it communicate this information? Um, so here we have an LED strip, um, which has different colors and a bunch of animations to help the pedestrian know. So if the, if the color becomes green, that means the pedestrian has been seen by the car. 
Um, another thing we noticed is that all our participants borrowed from cues that people are familiar, familiar with today, um, with interacting with other sorts of devices, not just cars. Uh, so for example, LED strips are common, displays were common. Um, they also used uh, human-like cues that, again, they're used to using right now in their interactions with pedestrians. So for example, we have eye gaze here, which is very much similar to how humans do this. So um, using all this information, we came up with a preliminary design space. Um, of possible designs. So the first kind of categorization we had was the modalities themselves. So what are the possible modalities? So out of the 34 designs we received, um, all of them had either visual cues, auditory cues, or what we call physical cues. So physical cues are things like uh, such a sense of touch, so haptic feedback, um, actuation of some sort of cue to communicate the same information to a pedestrian. So we took our 34 designs that we got from our participants, um, we kind of broke down all the cues that they had in their interfaces and we placed them in one of these categories. So for example, if you had an LED strip, it would show up as an implementation uh, right here under the visual category. So LED strip on the vehicle. We also noticed that um, every single design had cues that had three possible locations. Um, so for example, there were cues that were placed on the vehicle, cues that were placed on the street, and cues that were placed on the pedestrian. So um, the design space currently is empty here, um, but if you look at the paper, we have details of uh, all the possible implementations that our participants had. So once we had our design space figured out, we then wanted to um, actually try this out in practice and see whether this would actually help pedestrians make crossing decisions. Now, because the design space is infinitely vast and there are many possible combinations that we could use, uh, we opted to ensure that we kind of captured the essence of the design space so we made four prototypes. We made prototypes that incorporated um, the, the physical locations of the cues themselves. Um, we tried to balance out all the modalities that were possible. Um, we made sure that every single interface prototype we made had an awareness cue, which is again, the vehicle has seen the pedestrian, but also an intent cue, which is I'm going to stop or not stop. So I'm gonna show you what those prototypes look like. And before I do, I want to mention that we, we implemented all our prototypes, so we had four in total, on two different platforms, one on a uh, car, just a traditional car, and a second, a Segway, which is a mobile robot, a two-wheeled robot, and I'll explain why we chose both those platforms. But before that, um, the four interfaces, so this is the vehicle-only interface. So the hallmark of this interface is that all the cues uh, are on the vehicle themselves for the interface. So here we have two combinations, so we have a visual cue and the LED strip, we have a speaker, which is an auditory cue, and it plays human-like voices. And you'll notice all the cues are physically on the vehicle. The next interface we had was the vehicle street interface, and this one incorporated cues both on the street and on the vehicle, shown here. Uh, one of them was a visual cue, and the other was, again, human-like voice on the, on, the, on the vehicle itself. The third type was the vehicle pedestrian interface, and this one incorporated cues on the vehicle, as well as on the pedestrian. So you'll see there's a display with a face which pretty much resembles what human-like, uh, like an animated human-like entity would look like. And there's also haptic feedback on the pedestrian. Finally, we had a mix of all three, which is the vehicle, street, and pedestrian. We also had all three modalities that are, up, that are showing up here, and you'll see them shown here. So after making these prototypes, uh, as I said, we assessed them in two different platforms, one on a Segway, one on a car. Both were Wizard of Oz studies. One was conducted indoors, one was conducted outdoors. Um, the reason we chose the Segway is that um, it allowed us to be, uh, to be able to operate the vehicle autonomously to make it appear autonomous. So we were teleoperating the Segway uh, to make it look autonomous. The issue is that because the Segway is a small vehicle, um, we were afraid that you know, if we have a smaller size, it's not a very realistic crossing scenario because it's in a corridor. We also wanted to explore this in a car, uh, in a physical car in a parking lot. So here is, um, hopefully there's no sound, but here we have, so here you can see, um, sorry. Looks like the, inter um, the display is stuck. Okay, sorry. Oops. Okay. So essentially the, the goal of this study was to have a participant come up to the corridor and observe the segue and make a crossing decision. We had five tasks that the participant did. There was a baseline condition where the vehicle only provided its motion information. Um, we also had the four interface cases, um, which had, as already described, the four interfaces. 
And in each of these cases, the participant had to make a decision on whether they wanted to cross or not based on the information that the vehicle was providing. Similarly, we conducted a study outdoors, uh, but here we had a controlled in a parking lot situation. The participant was told um, because of safety reasons not to physically cross, but actually gesture that they wanted to cross um, using something like a thumbs up gesture. And we had the exact same five tasks. So what did we actually find here? Um, so we had 20 user studies that we conducted based on uh, the two platforms, 10 in the Segway study, 10 in the car study. And we found that the awareness and intent aspects of these interfaces are crucial. And it was reaffirmed to us uh, through, this, through this study. Um, another thing we found is that when we were asking our participants to compare awareness and intent against each other, um, we found that intent was slightly more important to them. We think one possible reason is that while awareness gives you information that the vehicle has seen you, it's not necessary for a vehicle to stop for you if they've seen you. And so intent information is more important. In both our studies, this was affirmed. Um, we also have um, a comparison of interfaces versus the baseline condition. Um, in our paper, we dive into some of the numbers and uh, we found that there was a significant improvement when we had an interface as opposed to just the vehicle motion for three of the four interfaces. So the most effective interface, I would not, uh, so um, for the most part, it's not so important which interface is the most effective because we only had one implementation of all these four categories. However, the hallmark and the most important thing about this is that there are two considerations or two uh, characteristics that make up the most effective interface for us. The first is that you'll notice in the Segway study and the car study, both of the successful interfaces had multimodal aspects to them. So there are cues of three different modalities here. There are cues of two modalities here. Another hallmark is that um, the locations of the cues themselves are not just on the vehicle in both these interfaces. We have some on the vehicle and some elsewhere in both the car and the Segway study. Okay. So based on all this information, we have a couple of design considerations. There's more in the paper, but I'm going to dive into two of them quickly. The first is how do we actually pick and design interface cues? Um, so for the most part, the most important thing we think from our studies and from our analysis is that um, there is a disparity between using discrete and continuous um, cues. So cues that are discrete are cues that have specific states that uh, can be transitioned into as opposed to continuous cues. So things like eye gaze. So, a lot, so the eye gaze was the, mo the worst performing uh, cue for us in our studies. And part of the reason is that because you have eye gaze and, and for a computer or display that's using eye gaze, it's hard for someone to tell that the eye gaze has been established. Whereas something like an LED strip that has three states, for example, is much easier for someone to understand. Another thing is that num the number of states themselves are very important. So uh, we want to make sure that we don't have too many states for pedestrians to be aware of when they're making their crossing decisions. So uh, another thing is we want to avoid overloading the pedestrian with too much information because they already have so much to do. They're making life and death decisions. So we must make sure we don't overload them with too much information. So for example, this interface right here is a mixed interface. So there are three cues here. And in the Segway study, it was the most popular um, interface because we think that because a lot of people who uh, did the study had never worked with the Segway before, uh, they thought that having a lot of information was, was useful for Segway. But in the car study, something that they're very used to interacting with today, they found that it was too excessive. Uh, it was hard to remember all the, all the different inf pieces of information. And so we would definitely have to be very cognizant of overloading the pedestrian when we're actually making these interfaces. Um, and obviously, if we have too many queues and too many states, uh, pedestrians could possibly uh, misinterpret these. Another thing is uh, responsibility distribution. So um, currently, when we're making crossing decisions, uh, for the most part, the pedestrian and the vehicle, or the driver inside the vehicle, have some level of responsibility towards making sure that the interaction is safe. Um, so depending on the driving culture, this may be shifted more towards the pedestrian or the driver. Um, but generally speaking, there is some level of responsibility in both cases. Um, in our study, when, in our car study, when we started putting interfaces and we interviewed our participants, we asked them, did you feel more or less responsible for the crossing decision? We found that half our participants felt that the interfaces kind of made them um, feel that the car is more responsible for their, you know, whatever happens. Um, so if the car, for example, gives this information to the pedestrian that you can cross and it makes a mistake or the cues are inaccurate, that means pedestrians felt that, you know, this is not my responsibility because the vehicle is giving me all this information. So you have to be very careful that if we are making interface cues, uh, they have to be very you know, reflective of the vehicle state currently, and they have to be as accurate as possible. So uh, in terms of future work, um, there's a couple things we want to do, but some of the most important things is scale. So for the most part, we had one pedestrian and one car for each of our studies. 
that's not a very realistic scenario in, in the real world because there are multiple cars, multiple pedestrians all the time. And so that's what we want to, we want to do. We want to see if our interfaces can actually scale to these conditions where there's you know, 50 pedestrians and 50 cars. Um, we also want to explore other scenarios. So we only looked at unmanned crossing scenarios. There could be scenarios like the car being idle, a car at a parking lot that's reversing. There's many possible scenarios we could explore beyond what we did. And so we want to look at those in the near future. So the main takeaways from this talk, three things. One, communicating awareness and intent in an interface is crucial if we want people to understand what autonomous vehicles are doing so that um, we can make crossing decisions. The second thing is that um, we should strive to build multimodal interfaces because pedestrians have different needs. And by, make, by making them multimodal, we, we ensure that everyone is able to make safe crossing decisions. And finally, um, we don't necessarily have to be restricted to making interfaces just on the vehicle or queues on the vehicle. We can explore um, other possible locations. So with that, thank you very much, and I can take questions. Thank you for the talk, uh, Chris Johnson, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, I was triggered by this counterintuitive finding that you highlighted that on the Segway, uh, they, um, the, the users wanted more cues or they, they liked it, whereas on the car, they didn't like it. And if a Segway hits you, it can do harm. <laughs> if a car hits you, it, it do, does a, a, a lot of extra harm. So I was wondering um, whether this is something to do with your study. So was I was wondering whether, because the car was driven by a human, I'm suspecting. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So might it be that some of your participants thought they could pick up the cues from the human still? So um, so I didn't actually describe the details okay. of the car study, but essentially we, we told the participants that there was only data collection going on and the, or the, the driver was never actually trying to make any sort of gestures or eye contact, was not even looking at the pedestrian while the vehicle was moving. And so for the most part, and because we conducted these studies both in the day and the night, and we kept the pedestrian far away enough from the vehicle, that we think that there shouldn't have been much of an effect, if any, um, of the, the driver themselves physically being right. there. Um, but of course, we cannot clearly delineate that because we did our studies with um, yeah. someone inside. Yeah. So I think uh, this is where the value of the, uh, having the segue in it is yes, really exactly. crucial. Be exactly. But I'm, I'm not sure whether I want to jump to the same conclusion that it's for the segue mm -hmm. useful, but I think it's more of a cue like when there's a... When there's not, yeah. A system a person, that really yeah. is a system and not with a human. That the right, right. Is, uh, so, so that's why yeah. I think, yeah, if we were doing future tests, we would definitely want to include, um, like, try to get rid of the driver as much as possible and isolate the conditions so that we can, you know, see whether this is actually the case. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Jim yeah. Brown from Southampton University. Hi. So towards the end, you talked about over-reliant of information to, to users. In your study, did you find sort of your interfaces may actually help them to be less over-reliant? Or in fact, in the paper, did you talk about other design ideas on how to overcome this issue? Um, so what we noticed so far is that, uh, of course, it's preliminary because we only had 10 participants, but it um, seems like if you give information, if you're giving really clear information to uh, pedestrians when they're making their crossing decisions, um, there is a tendency, and from what we can tell, we did both interviews and in our questionnaires, we found that uh, pedestrians are more likely to trust the vehicle and believe that whatever it's giving information-wise is correct. And so there is a tendency to be over-reliant on, on, um, on the interface. And so we haven't explored how we can overcome that limitation because we don't know necessarily um, whether it scales up to multiple people, pedestrians, and so on. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, nice talk. My name is Louis. Um, I have a question about um, what insights you might have gained from prior to the experimentation itself. So to what extent did, um, did you, did, did, did participants need to kind of like figure out, oh, what does the lights mean from your instructions and explanation? So yeah. it's a question about, you know, adaptation or, or, or training. Yeah, so for the most part, we had minimal training. Um, the only thing we made sure of is that before the interface, uh, before we started the, the trial for that interface, we would give them a sheet and explain what are the states for that interface and what you should be looking out for. So um, perhaps a lot of, um, if, if someone has more exposure to these cues uh, as time goes on, perhaps even the mixed interface could be effective. Um, because for example, if you have three different cues, it might be hard to keep track of when you're doing this for the first time, but as time goes on, maybe you'll be okay with receiving more cues. The thing is that we haven't done long-term studies on this, right? We've only done short-term studies. We, we present an interface and we basically asked participants to you know, make a crossing decision. Uh, and so maybe in the long term, it would be it would be interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. So while you're taking the yeah. last question, oh, sure. we'll do a speaker sure. switch. Yeah. Hi. 
I'm Yaliang Zhuang from Andover University of Technology. Uh, in your workshop, you talk about uh, human behavior. And I, I just wondering, when you do the experiment, did you ever uh, to ask the participant to evaluate the social communication or emotional interpretation? So we didn't uh, look at that aspect. Um, we kind of we were just looking at objectively, can the pedestrian make a crossing decision that is safe for them based on whatever cues we're giving them? Uh, so we haven't looked at the social engagement aspect, but that would be very interesting. 